Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm David Holmes. My guest tonight is Buffy Bernhardt, who lives near the Hudson River in New York State. She's a psychotherapist, a follower of Mayor Barber, a painter, a poet, photographer and a potter. And this interview was recorded a few days ago. So hi Buffy, welcome to the program and thank you for allowing us to into your home. Yes, well I'm delighted. I'm I've looked forward for a while to, to do this yeah, with we're, you. We're finally doing it, that's great. Yes, it's great. Um I'd like to start off with where your life is now and for you to give us a, a summary of how you see yourself and then we'll proceed later on to talk about the background and history of that sort of thing. So how would you how would you sum up your life now what what is your what are your thoughts on where you are right now okay well I think um, I I wanted to give a little bit of it's sort of my life has been like a patchwork quilt of many many pieces leading up to where I am now and um, so it's really been a, a spiritual journey I've got many parts of my life obviously I have a son and a family and so forth but this is the spiritual chapter of my life and I wanted to say a bit about, um, I'm, I'm 65 and years old, and I feel like uh, these 65 years have been a compilation of many pieces leading me up to a place of what I really want now. And if I were to say, what do I want now, and what do I want for the last chapter of my life, and, and, and what do I want to achieve in the next 20 years or 30 or whatever years, um, I would say I want to achieve a profound state of peace within my soul. Okay. That's the first thing that comes to mind. And when I even say that, I just, it just feels so um, lovely and uh, in the flow and it doesn't take much to just click into that thought and then I'm kind of there. And um, I also want to achieve a very profound connection to the divine, mm -hmm. to God, the beloved, the divine. And um, what does that mean? Uh, well, for me, that means um, it's all in the interior. It's, I call it my interior landscape. It's all inside myself where I've learned over these years with this patchwork quilt that I've put together um, that all of this is inside myself, as it is with all of us. Mm -hmm. And when I can go inside, close my eyes, and get into that very still place within myself, and really access the spirit within me, there's a profound sense of love that is inside that I can access, that I can feel. And I do have a teacher, which we will get into, uh, his name, he's a spiritual teacher, he's not alive, but his name is Meher Baba. And um, we'll talk about the details of that. But um, that's a focal point for me. You know, like some people have Jesus or Buddha or... It's, it's a focal point. <clears throat> and um, Buddha used to say, I am a bridge, you know, between humanity and enlightenment or however you like to say it. So for me, uh, Meher Baba is my bridge. And so when I... When I go inside and I imagine him holding me like a little child, for example, and just surrender and let go, like a heavenly father type of thing, I really feel that I'm being held and loved. And it is very childlike inside, you know, deep inside myself, very kind of simple and innocent in a way, uh, even though I can be complex in many other areas. Right. So that's kind of, that's, the, the, that's what I want. I want to deepen all of that. And it's really all about truth, you know, inner truth, finding my truth, finding the truth of the universe. But I want to be soaked and saturated with that truth inside my own being so that I'm actually, I'm living in that space in a very profound way. Right. So we're going to go into your life review soon, but... You did you say you'd like to share some poetry with us before we proceed? Yeah, so I, I'm an artist, mm -hmm. and I've, I'm a photographer and a painter and many things, and I'm also a poet. Mm -hmm. 
And this kind of gives a sense of what I just described, I think, in a nice way. Uh, and actually, this came to me one morning in a meditation. So I, the title of the poem is God's Early Morning Gift. A being of softest presence, a comforter spirit who kindles hearts, woke me by early dawn. Like a feather pillow, it held me in tender embrace and caressed my aching soul. <clears throat> the invitation was imbued with spring. Sweet breezes wafted through my body, carrying me to an unearthly place of comfort and trust. Then a voice within said, I come to you as your loving father. Make yourself baby soft. Become like a tiny infant so I can pick you up and rack, wrap you in my cloak of love. A wave of innocence coursed through my blood. Purity and bliss melted my soul. The density of all physical disappeared as I swam in this ocean of divine nectar. Then, as if from on high, a downpour of light most intense showered into my inner world. Moving ribbons of light and shapes danced and whirled throughout my nervous system. I lay there, a victim of this holy fisherman who had enclosed me in his divine net. Time stood still. This lover soothed and kissed my inner sorrow. All darkness vanished. This light, whose very fabric is made of power and heat, did not burn or injure, but rather healed and resurrected the ignorance in my humanness. O oh, blessed Divine One, invite me to sit at your feet. Show me once again your magnificent vortex of living light into which I now enter and drink of this fountain of love. Encase me in your presence. Let me into your ch hidden chambers so that I may enter and sit in your holy silence. And when I enter this shaft of light, show me Show me how to invite in all those in need of love, in need of healing and restoration, all those who have lost their way, so that you may illumine their darkness. O oh, heavenly creator of light, destroyer of darkness, hear my cry in the wilderness. I seek only to drink of your love. Liberate me from the chains that bind me. Kindle my heart so that I may return to my true essence within and live in sacred union upon your heavenly throne. Thank you. So, I'd like so to that's really, that's really, uh, that's what happens in my meditations, this very strong infusions of light and love and heavenly fire. It's very mystical. I would say I'm, I'm a mystic and it's very much difficult to describe, you know, those kinds of energies, but that's that's why I write poetry about this. Yeah, poetry is obviously a very strong uh, part of your life. A very, yes, it very is. Important. And maybe we'll talk about some of those details later on, but I'd like to start with something about your family history. And you said you were you're, you're born into a, a wealthy family with ancestral ancestral founding fathers of this country, could you tell us about the very the very very early t time of your family history? How that yes, well, we actually have a family tree that goes back to the four hundreds, but I'm not well, going to bore you with those details. <laughs> well, some other time. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, we have Samuel Chase, who was uh, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, yeah. and he lived uh, down south in Maryland, and. Um, uh, he, he, you know, he was part of the the founding uh, fathers of this country, and um, that's just one leg of my family. I have many different, you know, uh, branches of the family tree. But um, this this uh, family history, this rich history, has been infused in. It comes from my mother's side of the family, infused in um, our sense of of history of this country, and. Um, you know that's the powerful part. the 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 challenging part is these people who 
founded this country. They call them WASPs, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, you know, they, they started out with good intentions, but they also had ended up very elite, you know, and so um, it, it comes with uh, light and dark, you know, and um, so I, am I jumping ahead of, of your, your questions? Really. I mean, I'm, I'm flexible on all this because uh, have you done quite a bit of work on your family history? Do you have a lot of records of from that time to this? Oh, yes, so? we have books written and um, genealogy experts and uh, I actually have a one of my great grandmother is being honored uh, this week in Connecticut for her great historic um, prowess and expertise, and um, in, uh, you know, um, she was a great expert in, in um, trying to keep the colonialist movement alive back in the Victorian days. And uh, um, so she, we've inherited a lot of uh, antiques from her, and so we just have a very rich. Um, sense of uh, early part of this country yeah. my family. And your, your grandparents, what, what are your memories of them? Uh, you just told her briefly about your, your grandmother. Oh, well, <laughs> my grandmother, uh, she was an extremely elegant woman, uh, a very romantic, beautiful poet, and uh, very wealthy and very privileged family and uh, from Connecticut. and. Um, my, my grandfather was uh, started a, a well-known insurance company in Hartford and uh, Connecticut and um, she was uh, you walked into her home back in in Farmington Connecticut and it was like walking into a museum it it, it was just magnificent filled with antiques mm -hmm. and um, the atmosphere was like walking into uh, just a rarefied museum, you know, and uh, I, I treasure that because it was just very beautiful experience. So there's been a creative kids. ability in your family over generations. Was that passed on to your parents and then yourself? Is it a continuous thing? They all had something, a creative side to them? Yes, they had creative. They also had a very profound relationship to the earth, mm. I must say. Uh, the, nature was very, very important. Um, I have uh, Frederick Law Olmsted is one of my uh, ancestors who is one of the um, the, the greatest uh, landscape architects uh, architects of this country, and he was responsible for many of the design of the uh, national parks in this country. He was an extremely talented man, and um, he he sort of left a legacy. And we've all had very very um, special relationship to the earth. My grandfather used to take my mother out when she was very young and uh, help her identify all the birds and uh, the bird songs and in the spring they would collect birds eggs which you would never do nowadays but they would take a spoon and collect birds eggs and then blow them out and um, she had tremendous collection of birds eggs and she could label every one she knew every bird call a mating call and we would always go out in the spring and look at the peepers which are these baby frogs in the spring and you know, early signs of spring, and it, it's very much in my soul. And it, it, it um, they were great gardeners. They had profound a sense of beauty. And um, my grandmother had a, a garden outside of her dining room window that was all white, so that she could see the garden in the moonlight during dinner. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Yeah, obviously, a lot and, of the earth. Uh, and were there? I know we talked a bit. Uh, ourselves about the national park were there places like that places big good prominent places of nature near you um, that you grew up in or uh, oh around? yes yeah well I, I, I grew up and I've lived most of my life in the Hudson uh, in the Hudson Valley and um, my hometown is Garrison and so um, Bear Mountain and uh, um, this very large expan tracts of, of forest land is part of my upbringing and so we would always um, spend a lot of time in nature. My whole childhood was part of nature, and I still do that now. It's almost my sacred sanctuary, one of my sacred sanctuaries, to go and commune and just be quiet and take in the spiritual part. It's very, very spiritual for me. And I, I, it was the same for my, my grandparents, and my brothers are the same way. We all hold this profound... Uh, sense of reverence for the living earth and um, a lot of knowledge actually we know yeah. the names of trees and plants and moss and ferns and you know there's that piece too. 
Right, so if we can move on to your early religious life. You were born, you were raised Episcopalian, which I think in the UK they call Church of England. Yes. Yet you said you you yearned to be Roman Catholic from a very early age. How would you explain <laughs> yes, that? Yes, um, you know, this... Um, this elite upbringing that I had, uh, you know, the, the, you were taught to, um, to to hate everybody who wasn't like yourself. You know, that was the way it went. And it was very class, because it was very kind of old English type thing, you know. And um, there's an old uh, song from the, um, uh, the um, South Pacific that, that goes, you, you, you're taught to... You taught to hate the people that are not like your family or something like that. I forgot that song. You're taught to hate the people your relatives hate. And uh, so we, I was brought up like that. You know, if you were not Episcopalian and you were not of this class, you were not okay. And so um, that was part of my um, rebellious spirit that came later. But um, so this Episcopalian life was. Um, I felt was very dry, you know, they took out a lot of the juice, the Catholic juice, you know, and they kind of pared it down, you know, and um, so I used to go by the Catholic church and go by a, a monastery near us, and I loved all of that regalia and ritual and, uh, you know, pomp and circumstance that the church had with the incense and all of that, I, I adored that, and I felt they were much more spiritual than we were so I always wanted to be Catholic I think that's from another lifetime though because I spent many lifetimes in monasteries which I don't know if you want to go there right now but that's one of my knowledge about myself um, right. that that I have right so um, you you've raised Episcopalian but did you gradually grow out of it and you've suddenly discovered that you didn't want to do it or did you go into Catholicism in a, in a big way Oh my gosh, that was a taboo. I never let my parents know that I had a secret wish to be Catholic. I, uh, you, you know, you either towed the line or you were, you were out. I mean, that was it. It was very, very strict and rigid. And, um, you know, uh, they tried to mold me and make me a socialite and, you know, make me part of the social, you know, uh, coming out party and all this sort of business. And I didn't want to have anything to do with that. And so I, no, I, I, um, was not allowed to go outside of the very strict upbringing. I was sent away to boarding school at age 13. That was part of the, um, the, the English style. It's very much in that society, that's what you did. You send your children away to school very early, and, and that's, that's just the way it was, you know. And uh, So I went away to school with all the same kind of people that I was. <laughs> so, you, said, um, you said you had a, an unconscious mystical soul that drove you to speak the truth. Was that a very early thing? Was that always with you, that, that rebellious slightly, but also a seeking of uh, more Good. of the Good, yeah, truth. that's a nice thing to say. I think that underneath, I remember driving by this Catholic monastery in my hometown with a lot of uh, crosses and statuary and candles burning and everything, and my mother hated that place. It's called Graymore, and she thought it was the dregs, you know. And I would go by, and I would secretly cross myself, and... I think what I was really doing was I really was looking for, and I didn't know this at the time until quite a bit later, but I feel that all along my life I was looking for something that was greater than this world that I was involved in, something that was, I don't know, there's got to be more than this in other words. Yeah. There's got to be more than, you know, getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and, you know, having lovely antiques in our home and, and you know, lovely parties and all of that sort of thing. There has to be more. There has to be profound richness someplace. Right. And so I feel that that thread in me from, I know it comes from other lifetimes, thread in me to seek the mystical truth, the inner truth, the universal truth, the cosmic truth has always pushed me along even though I wasn't right. consciously aware of that. Right, so that maybe the rebellious streak can, well it's probably continued on to this day but um, <laughs> you, we, maybe we're just moving into talking about the 60s and it's something as you know I was a, a teenager in the 60s from the, the Beatles, the, the flower power uh, exactly. Woodstock. Exactly. Yeah. There's something in one <laughs> the stuff I was reading about which I really like 
Yeah. Lived in Paris with a Mexican Marxist who participated in the, in the revolution of student upbringings. That was a very revolutionary, for those of us that were there, and we both yes. were there. Um, the, a, a Mexican Marxist, wow. <laughs> well, yeah. And, um, you know, I went over there. Dad paid my way over there, of course. You know, that's how you did it. You know, I, and um, he, he paid my way to live with a French family. They're aristocrats, of course. You know, I had a big chalet and the whole chateau, I mean, and the whole thing. And um, so that was the trappings that I went and stayed in, in Paris. But um, underneath that, I had this curiosity about, well, what's outside of this ivory tower thing here? And um, so I was at the Louvre one time and uh, sitting on the stone wall at the Louvre. That's before they had the big pyramid in the front. And I don't know, I was just mooning around and looking at something, I don't know what. And this Mexican guy comes up, very sophisticated, intellectual guy. Obviously, he was, you know, presented in a certain way. And we got to talking, and uh, one thing led to another, went to the cafe and so forth. And then um, I eventually had a relationship with this guy, and he ended up being a Mexican Marxist who had moved to Paris to publish Mexican documents. He couldn't publish them in Mexico. So he moved to, 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 to Paris in the 60s, of course, you know, that time when the whole establishment was blowing up ev everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up living with this guy, and um, he was very much involved in the whole rebellion. That There was a big revolution going on in Paris at that time. When, I don't know if you remember the Sorbonne, the Sorbonne was, I was just gonna mention that, yeah. crazy, and the students were, they shut the city down, basically, and you couldn't get any sugar or anything. It was quite dramatic and uh, he thought this was wonderful you know and um, but it's so funny because I I'm not a uh, revolutionary uh, go kill him type person I'm more of a subtle type so I would watch all of this and be fascinated thinking oh my gosh he's got the truth he must have an eye into the truth and there was the you know Vietnam War that was so outrageous and we were so angry about that and we'd sit in the cafes with our gold wall cigarettes and you know carry on in these intellectual conversations for hours and hours and very idealistic and so that was so uh, churning in my blood it was almost like we were from Mars all of us and we yeah. plopped down onto the earth and just blew everything up and said oh, all this has to go this old crusty old stuff you know sure so that was the beginnings of my I didn't really know it so much, but I now, in retrospect, that was the beginning of my seeking a better way and seeking the truth. Right. So Marxism looked like, oh, that's fair, everyone gets to be equal, etc. So that was kind of where that was. And the joke was that mom came over to visit one time, and of course we went to Maxime's restaurant, you know, that's yeah. the very famous restaurant in Paris, with, with my... Maurizio, my boyfriend, <laughs> how dare he go to Maxime's? He's a Marxist. But he went anyway, and of course somebody else paid, so you know how it goes. And at the end of the meal, my mother didn't have any money. <laughs> she left her money at the hotel. So that was a terribly embarrassing, funny moment with this, you know, capitalist pig. That's what it was in those days. You know, this capitalist pig with the Marxist at the table, she doesn't have any money to pay for the Marxist. So I thought it was a... A funny story there. Yeah, I've been to Maxime's in Lisbon, but not in. Um, oh, really? Not in Paris, but that was a, the energy of that time, that the, the drive to change and the feeling that we could change the world, and I think we did. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was just. Uh, bravo! Yeah. It's, exactly. Uh, Very exciting times. Certainly was. Yeah. And then yeah. we maybe move on to your personal growth, and and uh, around mm. the early to mid seventies. You said that you went through EST, which was your yes. debut with your personal growth. Could you explain that time of your life? Yeah, so I came back having lived in Paris and did that whole thing. Um, and I came back and um, actually I met a Japanese gentleman. I seem to like these foreign people. Uh, Japanese gentleman when I came here. And then I I did my Japanese thing for quite a while. And, um, you know, that was another phase. But... Um, he was an artist, so that got me going with my art thing, you know, and so my artist is part of my free spirit and part of my spirituality as well. And um, anyway, that relationship, we lived together for five years, and after that, something called Est 
came along. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was uh, the first big, um, what do you say, big uh, um, personal growth training. Yeah. Training for personal growth, really, in this country. Yeah. Uh, um, the TM movement was also going on at that time. It was the begin very early parts of that beginning of meditation and in the 70s. And EST was a very, very profound weekend workshop where basically um, they, they have something called the forum, which is now EST with a different name. They've toned it down to be very gentle, but this was a, like going into the military. It, they screamed and yelled at us to wake up and, you know, four-letter words and very harsh treatment, and um, it was very profound. I liked it. I wanted somebody to shake me up and say, wake up, you know, get all that cement off of your being, and don't you know you're a, a beautiful spirit and all of this, and so... It was very, very heavy-duty hammer treatment of waking yourself up. And um, I actually had a profound spiritual awakening there. For the first time in my life, I was hearing that there is something more than this that meets the eye. There is a truth out there. You know, you do have a beautiful spirit inside yourself. You know, all of this wonderful truth-seeking that I've been seeking my whole life. And that was my first entry into that and it changed my life basically right and, and after that you started with the siddha yoga yes and you said something that i found really interesting was that um you felt you could never climb over the wall so was there a yes. a, a, a reluctance or it didn't do it didn't really satisfy you it was okay but you need to yeah. there's nothing more something more than that would that be true Yes, okay, so, so let me give you a little background about, about what this Siddha Yoga thing was. Yeah. Um, after the S training, one of my friends who I went through the training with said, Oh, I just know that you are ready to me learn to meditate. Well, I'd hardly even heard of the word meditate. It wasn't popular then. There was no yoga anywhere. This, none of that was going on. So I said, Okay, good, fine. It'll take me wherever I need to go. So we went to this so-called ashram. And uh, an ashram is a place of spiritual um, retreat type place. And here was, walked in the door, and here are all these pictures of these gurus, Indian gurus. Well, I had never seen anything like that in my whole life. None of this was popular in those days. And it kind of freaked me out because I thought, oh, what is this idolatry here? And, you know, what are they worshiping this person on the wall and all this? And um, so um, I actually went with my, my ex-husband and my friend, and we sat down, and we started to chant. And for those who have never really done some profound chanting, I had another spiritual, profound spiritual experience chanting what happened was you kind of get into this rhythm of this repetitive mantras that you chant and basically I felt like the ceiling was coming off it was so profound it, the, the liveliness and the generating of energy and uh, it got into a very deep inner state inside myself for the first time and it just was out of this world experience ecstasy really mm -hmm. and um so when we finished the chant, I kind of got over myself with the pictures on the wall and the guru and all this stuff. And I, we started coming to this ashram. And uh, we spent many, many years as part of what they called Siddha Yoga. It's um, run by, was run before he died by Muktananda. Then Guru Mai took over as the guru. She's very famous. Muktananda's famous too. And... Muktananda basically, along with Maharishi Yogi, who's the TM guy, brought meditation to this country. And um, so um, we spent all of our summers living upst upstate in the big ashram. We had a very large ashram. The main ashram was India, in India. And um, Muktananda came from a lineage of other gurus. And um, so this was my, I call it my spirit, I was... Awaken. This was my spiritual home where I woke up spiritually, and we learned to meditate and chant and all this. And so, as I 
I'll answer your question in a second, okay. but I just want to give a little background. Sure. Um, we went through many different retreats. Over this was about a 12-year span. You know, we had a meditation center in our house. We lived this whole life. You know, as a matter of fact, um, I wanted to mention that uh, when my son Ian was born, he was born at seven months early, and so he had to be in an incubator. And we had pictures of these gurus around the incubator with the mantras piped into his feeding tube. And the nurses were astounded because he he was healed and he, he had a lung problem. And he got out of that incubator so quickly. And the nurse even said to me, I think it's because you had all those mantras and all that pictures around the incubator. And I, I know that's true. And um, so that was very powerful. You know, we just lived this life. It was very, very, all of our focus was around this. And I, I want to say about a thing about the guru thing. Um, in the West, we don't have a culture that um, particularly understands what a guru is. The closest thing is Jesus Christ, where we, if you're a Christian, you, you know, you, you love or you follow the teacher called Jesus. Um, but the, in the Indian culture, the guru is, as I said earlier, like the Buddha said, is a bridge between the human, excuse me, let me take a drink of water here, is a bridge between the human state that you're in, which is a mixture of ignorance and wonderfulness. You know, we have a mixture in ourselves. And so the, so the guru is a bridge between whatever human state we're in and the enlightened state. And... Um, my teacher, Mayor Baba, my present teacher, Mayor Baba, says that the guru who is an enlightened guru, and I'm talking about these very advanced enlightened beings, uh, the enlightened guru's job is that his ego or her ego is very um, polished up. It's in a very higher self state. It's not in a false self state. So this, so the job of the guru is to ask the disciple or the devotee to ride on the guru of the ego, to trust that that guru's ego is evolved and enlightened, so that guru ego can take you to the enlightened place. And so there is worship of this being. It, it's, a, it's a devotion. It's called a bhakti path, a lover of God. And this guru relationship is a very much based on love, love and, and devotion. And anyway, so that's, that's what the guru thing is. So okay. that's important. It's, the West has a little trouble with that. Right. Do you want me to go on about the yeah, I think small so, thing? Um, did you continue with, I mean, I'm, I'm leaning into your association with like the, the Christian mystics, the female Christian mystic. Did you? Well, let me answer the question about the wall. Can I answer sure. the question about Certainly, the wall yeah. thing first? Yeah. Sorry, I'm blabbing on it great length here. Anyway, so while I was um, went through this uh, city yoga, I went through something called the month-long course, and it was a course inside a tent that was the size of a football field. And inside you walked in and it had all these amazing shrines all around the outside of it. And you walked in and you did the course in silence for a month. And it was very profound, very rigorous. And I had very deep mystical experiences there. I actually um, had visions. I had um, just um, profound connections to, to the divine. It was very, very deep for me. And I had a, 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 a vision of this earth being healed. It was extremely profound. But the whole time that I was with Siddha Yoga... I could, I never could feel like I could climb over this wall to true divine love. I could never quite get there. I couldn't, I knew there was some kind of a love that's greater than human love, but I couldn't get there. Mm -hmm. So that's my answer. I couldn't climb over the wall with Siddha Yoga. I had all the other things, but not that part. So you continued your association with Siddha Yoga, but it was just something missing there that you couldn't quite yes but there was so much there to to, mm. to gain that I stayed and, and had a rich bounty of an, of an experience but this thing that was gnawing at me kept driving me to look for 
this kind of love that is superhuman, that is not of the human origin. Yeah. Right, so then your relationship or association with the female Christian mystics, were there any in particular that stood out to you or was just a general subject of Christian mystics that drew Yes, yeah, so at the time, um, the, the ashram started to get downsized and the, the gurus started to close down bit by bit. And that kind of led me to want to seek some other things. So I started reading Lives of Christian Mystics, Female Christian Mystics, and my first book was The Diary of a Soul by St. Teresa um, of Lisieux, and uh, she's called The Little Flower. And this book was very thin. It was almost like a child. She used to talk about how as a young girl she would go into the forest and make little shrines for God and just very innocent it's called the little way, very simple, very like a child adoring type of thing. And that was my first book, and it had a very profound effect on me. Then I read many, St. Catherine of, of Siena, um, St. Teresa of, of Avila, many, many. I, I read I don't know, almost 40 books on these, all the different saints. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that fascinated me was, and I wanted, this is the reason I read those books, because they had, a, they found a kind of love that I could not obtain, and I wanted that love. I wanted that incredible uh, mystical love experience. So I kept reading those books, right? Studying those lives. So w when when did you come into contact with past lives, or w when did your awareness of them start in your life? Was it very early? You okay, no, actually. Now I, we're kind of downsizing the ashram. The ashram got closed off. I'm now delving into this Christian mysticism stuff. And um, I had a very profound experience. Um, now I'm kind of now finding, oh, there are other things. You know, I thought I was in city yoga for the rest of my life. But now it wasn't that way. That's this patchwork quilt thing. So now all of a sudden I'm like experimenting with other things. And I started to... Um, study Native American spirituality. That was one of the things that I started to, to delve into. And I went on a, a very powerful retreat down in Sedona, Arizona uh, at a healing school. And they did a lot of healing on a table and very intense healing work. And um, I had an extremely profound experience on the table with my eyes closed when I was being worked on by the healer that I was a Native American who lived near the Grand Canyon and I actually could hear the drums in my head and I saw these this life as clear as a bell it's like I'm looking around in my house now and I understood that I was a child who was born with special shamanic gifts um, and and gifts of a healer and so they took me aside in this society and they raised me as a shaman and I I can't describe it, but it was so real, so visceral. I saw every single thing. I saw the shoes I had on. And um, so when uh, I went, we, after the healing experience, my husband and my son and I were together, went to the Grand Canyon. Uh, and I put my foot on the ground, and I burst out into uncontrollable crying, recognizing that this was the place that I was that shaman. And I knew it, and I had it viscerally in my body and I walked out to the edge of the Grand Canyon and I knew that I was a shaman from those days back way back in the Grand Canyon one of my jobs was to maintain the health of the environment through sounding and through toning and sounding and it was very moving very profound very important for me to see this sacred relationship to the earth that I had in my bones from another lifetime that looks like I got it from my grandparents and my parents yeah. but in fact it was from this Native American lifetime right, so that was it, one of many past lives that I've recognized and had yes yeah, it's, it's something that it's hard to explain isn't it you is there would you describe it as a knowing that that well happened? I saw this hmm. my yeah. you know there's an inner vision you know the third eye when your third eye awakens spiritually you actually have the the ability some people have the ability to actually see. You actually see in front of your eyes. I saw 
the Indian slippers I wore. They, I could see the design. I saw the drums. I saw everything. So I had sight, clairvoyant sight internally. Right. I also heard the drums. It, it, it's really kind of odd to talk about it, but it's real. And I had another experience in a, as a mystic in the Middle Ages in a, in, a, in a church. I was a nun. And I won't go on at this great length, but I had another very visceral, visual experience of this lifetime as a nun, very devotional to Christ, extremely uh, mystical lifetime. So these are images you actually see that life. They're yes, see, I actually have seen all of these images, and I have exact recall as I speak about them. I can draw the images, actually. Hmm. Is it yeah. a... Auditory as well? Is it just mainly yes. visual? You're actually immersed in it at the time. Well, it, it, the, in the in the um, as a nun, I didn't hear anything. But as a, a native a Native American, I heard the drum beats that they were. I heard the drums. I could hear the drums. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. was a profound time of your life, and then came a difficult time in your life. Your your divorce from Alan. Um, was that a time of pers obviously a very painful experience? But did you? feel in retrospect you gain personal growth after well do you mind if I interject one thing Certainly, no there? Problem at all. yeah um, it, it when I got out of city yoga and I started like uh, experimenting with all these other things you know the Native American thing was a very large part of my life I took I trained in it I took shamanic training with uh, D um, Michael Harner who was one of the great teachers mm -hmm. and um, I spent a lot of time doing spiritual journeys and developing my psychic abilities that's that's what happened that's how I did that through this Native American spirituality you go inside and you go into these underworlds and you you access your spirit guides and wolf the wolf was one of my guides and I did an enormous amount of of, of this kind of work and um, when my son uh, went to school in Manhattan uh, he went to school near Central Park. So I would drop him off at school and then go what I call take shamanic journeys in the park. And I would, it would, I can't describe it, but it was profoundly mystical for me. I would walk in the springtime. Remember, one time I stood under this cherry tree with all these pink blossoms blossoming. And I could, I almost felt like I turned into the tree. That's how... It's like my, my human thing disappeared, and I just became the tree. And um, it's, it, it's hard to describe this kind of thing, but it, the, 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 um, it's almost like I, I had some sort of a deep um, transparency of myself, and I was able to completely connect on the deepest level with the nature world. And I would take these walks. I remember one time it was pouring rain, in Central Park buckets and I I felt like I was being bathed in this sacred water it, it, it's so hard to talk about this stuff but yeah. um, it was very profound for me um, to uh, have this Native American experience right and uh, yeah so the after the, did that steer you into areas uh, after that I mean after that I don't want to get too personal but the the, um, no, go the, ahead. I'm the fine. The personal growth when it's painful, but and um, did you find yourself? Did you discover a lot more about yourself? And and you. Okay, you that's a nice thing yeah. to ask. Yes, um, yes. Well, asked really cracked open the door about looking at my shadow part, looking at the stuff that wasn't working for myself. That was asked. The, the the first thing I went through. So that was I was really on a roll with getting the magnifying glass with myself and looking at myself, looking at all my shortcomings and working on how to heal all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was an ongoing journey in Siddha Yoga. Um, all of, you know, spirituality and self-growth are the same thing. You, you don't go on a spiritual path and not grow. That's the point of it. And so um, all the while, uh, throughout this whole time, I'm glad you asked that question, um, it was really about self-improvement. You know, how am I going to improve myself, you know? And um, if I, uh, um, well, I mean, for example, here's an extreme example. I, I was, believe it or not, <laughs> 
I was ha I had tremendous difficulty public speaking, and um, when I I gave birth to my son because I had a panic attack public speaking at my job, and uh, I, I I had to stand up in front of these people. I was seven months pregnant and stand up in front of the hospital where I worked and present uh, a talk, and I had a full blown panic attack and I completely stopped breathing totally, and I gave birth to my son that night. And the next day, I've always heard this guidance inside myself. The next day, my guidance said, you will get over that uh, phobia of, of, of public speaking. And so that was a big deal for me. And so when we had the meditation center in our home, I had to stand up and present and introduce people and, you know, do the standing up in front of people thing. And Gradually, I got over that, and now I don't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never. Noticed. I love it now, but that—that's a—that's an example of self-healing. Yeah. And um, so I've had a lot of experience of looking at my shortcomings and how can I heal and grow through this whole journey. And you—you you would have that attitude, whatever the circumstance was, difficult times. Of, um, what can I lace? It's it's not it doesn't happen straight away, but through time, over time, um, we gain some insights and we become better people because of that experience. You would rather have not gone through it. The pain is dreadful. The price is always high. But absolutely, yeah. yes, and that's that is how we grow. Mm -hmm. You know, I always make a joke. You know, I, I'm I'm a psychotherapist and a healer. I have a practice and so forth. We haven't shared that yet, but. Um, with clients who I see, you know, every day, all day, I always joke, well, you know, if you're going to be hanging out at the country club with a martini, you're not going to look at your shadow self and worry about self-growth. You're just going to be having a good time. And life comes along and handle, hands us these challenges. And so how to, as you say, how to take those challenges and turn them into a positive growth experience. That's my whole approach with myself. Right, so is your, your practice as a psychotherapist, is that growing in a sense of what you do and how you process people? Do you have an approach? How would you describe your approach when, you're, when someone comes to you and they need some help? Um, is yeah. That a, is that a, a school of thought that you follow? Is it your own particular guidance that you go Yeah, good question. Or a combination well, of all of them? Nice question. Um, this came out of my life experience, you know, um, you know, in the Native American tradition, they say that you can't become a healer or a shaman until you're at least 50 years old and you have a tremendous amount of life experience. And so you have to have that under your belt. So, um, you know, you, you did mention my divorce. It was very painful. Like we can get into that in a minute, but very painful. But I turned that into a great learning experience. And so my work with, with people, I always say in a nutshell, it's really assisting my, myself as a practitioner is that I am there to assist another soul to find their way home to their truth within themselves. That's the whole idea. Yeah. And I use many tools for that. You know, I do a lot of visualization, inner work, inner child work. Um, but one of the things that I find very important is to teach people just what you said how to take a challenging life experience and not stay victimized by it and weakened by it, but turn it into, okay, what have I learned from that? What's the lesson? So that's, there's a lot of that in my work. Right. Um, we come now to Mir Baba, and I know that Mir Baba is a very profound, I've been a very profound influence on your life. When did you first get involved with that? What was your first experience of Mir Baba? Okay, well, um, actually, um, that came around after my divorce. And, and the divorce was um, uh, very, let me just say something about that. My, my husband became very seriously mentally ill. And I, I had to get out, get my husband, my son and myself uh, out of the marriage. But out of that came... Um, a very a much deeper seeking in myself to uh, to work on healing myself and so um, I actually had known about Mayor Baba uh, back in the 70s uh, so I'll just give you that quick background my brother 
uh, for a wedding gift, gave um, Alan, my ex-husband, and myself two one-way tickets to the Mayor Baba Center. And that's down in South Carolina, down south. And um, that is a metaphor. One-way tickets, in other words, means yeah. this is a one-way trip. You're not coming back from this one. But I had to, this was in the 70s, I had to go through all of these spiritual parts to myself to get to end up with Mayor Baba. But anyway, when I went down to the Mayor Baba Center, it's a 400-acre nature sanctuary down south, extremely beautiful with little cabins on the beach, and it's very special. But um, I walked on there, and there's an atmosphere on this land that is extremely rarefied and pure atmosphere. You can't help it. Everybody feels it when they go there, whether you're into Mayor Baba or not. And when I walked into his home, they have his home there as a museum, and I was given the tour through his house, and um, people, uh, the woman who was giving the tour, um, Jane, her name was, she picked up all of his belongings in such a sacred devotional way that all I could do was cry. It's, not like, it's almost like the universe came open and burst open my heart. And the, the love that I experienced there was extremely profound. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my first experience. But we were also involved in City Yoga at the time, so I never, we never pursued that. But, sorry to digress, but to okay. get back to your question, after, after I separated from Alan and went through all of this Christian mysticism, stuff and the Native American and everything. I went back down there with a friend to the Maribaba Center and when I put my foot on the land, the, the center there, the, uh, the nature sanctuary, um, I heard Maribaba's voice inside myself said, that's it, you're home and this is the last stop on the train for you. You've been all over the place with all these spiritual pieces that you've been through and this is, this is your home and this is it. And it, I had a huge heart-opening experience of love. And that wall that I could never climb over in Bhagavan Siddha Yoga, could find that truth of, of the divine love, I actually had that experience down there through the Mayor Baba connection. Right, so here, what you call an avatar, what does an avatar mean to you? Are there many different interpretations of that? Yes, the the traditional and classical, and I, Mayor Baba is called the avatar of this age. Um, there are many people use that word loosely. I think there's a film series, kid children's uh, film series called Avatar or a movie or something. Yeah. Um, basically, the classical use of the word avatar, and this is a little bit far out for those who are more on the conservative end, it's actually the same being who gets reincarnated over and over again, starting with Zoroaster, I think it was Zoroaster. And then going to Ram and going to Krishna and going to Buddha and going to Moha, uh, Moha, Jesus, Muhammad. Those are all the same incarnation in different forms in different cultures. And Mayor Baba is, is they say, he says that he is the avatar of this age. So he, these beings who are incarnated in different forms are all the Christ energy. And Mayor Baba is the Christ energy of this age. And each avatar comes to wake humanity up and offers a certain style, like Buddha offered a style or Jesus offered a style. And Mayor Baba said, I've come to awaken, not to teach. So that's what the shift of humanity is in right now, this shift of awakening. That's the function of him as the avatar. Right. So, anyway, that's the Christ energy. Okay. So, you've said that you consider yourself as a, a bridge between Eastern and Western mysticism. How would you describe your role in that? How would you explain that to other people? That well, okay, uh, the best way to say that is in my work with clients, I, I get most kind of clients I get are people who come in with all kinds of issues and problems, relationships and personal issues and all kinds of life problems and but they're the kind of people that are seekers deep down inside themselves they may not know that when they walk in the door but they're really seeking a higher truth seeking 
uh, a, a greater understanding of this life. And so um, it's, it's my job, which uh, that's my role, to, to really take these higher truths, you know, higher truths that are esoteric, mystical, uh, divine love, um, you know, all of this sort of um, esoteric truths that, that sometimes are difficult to understand and pare it down to very, very simple language so that people can get educated in higher truths. And so that's what I do all day long in my work. And um, through my my mystical experiences, which I'd, I'd love to read another poem. Sure. Yes, Fu. This is Go a good ahead. time. Go ahead. Through these mystical experiences that that I um, that I've had, um, I'm in the other world. I'm in the other world. These highly subtle, refined other dimensions. There are other dimensions than this dimension, and I'm in. I'm there in there, and so. It's, it's to try to step it down so that it becomes understandable. So here's, here's, a, um, here's, here's a, another poem. It's called Presence. A heavy snow fell, fell late last night, leaving the world covered in a blank of, blanket of purity. And then now as I walk through the bleakness of this muffled world, I listen to the silence that echoes throughout the forest. I breathe the frozen stillness into my lungs. The crisp, clean air jolts me into the present. The crunch of my footsteps crackles in my ears. I follow the steamy breath as it billows from my nostrils. I feel the tiny hairs in my nose becoming stiff from the shattering cold. What is it to stand in the present moment? It is to rest in the enveloping arms of sacred presence. It is to stand in the natural world and take in the innocence and beauty. It is to catch a fleeting glimpse of a glistening crystal upon the snow. To hear the deep thump, thump of cracking ice as it echoes its drum roll across the frozen lake. It is to watch the woodpecker in search of his meal as he skips lightly upon the bark. Up, up he goes, pecking here, pecking there, hunger leading him to the top. But why bother just to stand still and be present? Shouldn't I rather focus on my list of chores that keeps me in frantic chaos as I tear through my day? The wise one says, Ye who seek a life of happiness and peace will only find it in the tiny window of now that lies beneath and between the worlds of past and future. For within this tiny window of now lies the paradox of mysterious stillness, of love that expands into intoxicating bliss. By standing in your place of being, you transcend your world of trial and illusion and enter into the holy realm of all that is. Thank you. So that's my spiritual relationship to the earth and through mundane things like the woodpecker or the snow. Okay, so you obviously have many creative aspects to your life. Uh, you're an artist, a painter, a potter, photographer, as well as being a poet, but was that did that was that always with you? Did you always have an artistic? They grow. Did you have an attraction to that? Did you have a something you wanted to express that could only be done in those ways? Well, interestingly enough, uh, once again, that came after the S training. The S the that first bombshell in my life, that S training, was the beginning of everything for me. Um, I mean, I dabbled in a few things, but I I really. Um, uncovered it, it it it's like cleaned me off a bomb went off in myself and it cleaned off the the crud the cement off my being and I was able to um, I don't know find my true essence you know that's what happens when we clean up clean up and grow we find our true essence within ourselves and I found 
that I had this profound um, ability for color, and so I, I, I'm an abstract watercolorist, and um, I, I had a great sense of design that came through my pottery, and this, this, it's almost like Mayor Baba says that art is one of the closest ways to get to spirit and God, because it's through the opening of that creative energies that we can get a download of inspiration and that exciting moment that, uh, you know, oh my gosh, I have this great idea or this great thing I'm going to write. And, you know, it's just this energy and this juice that goes on. That's all the spirit moving through us. And so as I worked through all these different parts of my spiritual path, um, I, I just got involved in, in all these different things. And so now I've been taking photographs of flowers and I go out into nature and close-ups of flowers. I think you've seen a couple of those yeah, photographs. Yeah. And I have a profound a spiritual experience every time I take a photograph and I look at these flowers. So it's, mm. it's not just a mundane click the camera. It's a real relationship with nature through the, the, the spirit world. Right. Yeah. So where you live, the beautiful um, Hudson River, there must be many opportunities there to express your artistic ability. Do you find that a creative a very positive creative influence on you, actually where you live. Um, yes, it, yeah. it, nature is one of my sanctuaries and uh, I can't wait for spring to come because I love to, to uh, I'm a flower photographer, so I, I get tremendous spiritual nourishment out of going out to, you know, spend the quiet time in nature and, you know, when I, the stillness, the, the ability to go into nature and just be quiet and to open up the the ears and the eyes and the and the ears to you know the the senses to to feel and sense all this magic that's around it that's what happens to me with my camera yeah and also you live close to woodstock that very famous uh, yes. place that people <laughs> of my generation would remember very well and that amazing yes. concert in 1969 i i think you said you you didn't go to it, but you knew people that did what are your yes. memories of that late 60s time? Were you in the U.S. at that time? Or? No, I was in France with my Mexican Marxists. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and my brother was uh, walking around, I think, with no clothes on in Woodstock. You know, they were very wild in those days. And uh, he was a wild hippie, both my brothers yeah. and my, uh, my cousin and so forth. But you speak of Woodstock, that's been a part of my path also. Mm -hmm. There's a great monastery up there called the KTD Monastery. It's a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. And that's also been a part of my patchwork quilt journey. Um, I have a great, uh, it's a, I wish we could show a picture of this monastery, but... We, we, we'll it, find some way of doing that, maybe, yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's really like walking into Tibet. They had Tibetans come over and paint this magnificent building. It's extremely ornate. And you walk into this, to the shrine room, it's a sanctuary, and... The energy in there is so alive and pulsing with purity and aliveness and uh, just profound energy. And so I, I go up there a lot and I participate in the chants up there. I'm about to go to a retreat up there. And uh, the monastery was started by one of the great Tibetan leaders, was the Karmapa, was the third mm -hmm guy under the, uh, the Dalai Lama and so that's been also a part of my path is uh, I'm actually studying the Tibetan material right now and you know Pema Chodron and all yeah. of that that my poem just talked about being in the now being in the present yeah. and all of that um, you know how to do that you know if we just quiet down for a second which is the Buddhist teaching getting quiet getting still and getting present getting aware you know, eventually, if you really make that a practice, there's profound bliss and beauty and energy just pulsing in this universe right here and now in this present moment. And it's just packed, you know. Every second is packed with this potential for us to walk into that experience. So that's something that's very attractive to me in the, in the Buddhist study as part of my patchwork spiritual patchwork quilt life that I lead. That's right, and we all know that a few months ago that the East Coast went through that dreadful uh, weather, and I know your area was affected. Is, was it badly affected? Are you, I know we all hear about New Jersey and 
Oh yeah, crazy. the hurricane. Yeah, was that? Is that are they still well, recovering from that? Or yeah, the next town to me, uh, uh, it's. I just went down there the other day, and I was amazed that it's still ramshackled. You know, people's backyards are just ripped up, and uh, a lot of repair work done. But the you know, insurance companies take a very long time to get together, so it's it's still a big issue. But not as bad as New Jersey. That was no, pretty that's right. difficult. Uh, perhaps really go out to those people whose lives were. Yes. That, that also brings out those difficult times. Bring out um, the best in others sometimes, and the the giving nature of, of communities to come together at difficult times. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing you should say that because when the World Trade Center got hit, um, my um, of course you know I saw it on the news as it was happening, and um, my brother who lives down in Virginia, down south, he was. <laughs> Believe it or not, he was down in, in Thomas Merton's monastery down in Kentucky uh, on a retreat. So you can tell we're sort of on the same yeah. wavelength. And um, he had his pickup truck down at the, at, the, at the monastery, and he was in a retreat. And he heard this, and he said, I'm not staying in this retreat one more second. I'm getting in my truck. I'm driving up to New York City. I'm helping now. So he did that, and he called me on, en route on the way. And I said, well, gosh, I'll meet you there. And... So one thing left, led to another, and he's quite um, assertive in his way, and he a ended up getting into the armory, um, which was where they were uh, processing all the families uh, who lost loved ones. And he got, he got m myself and my son in there. So we actually went on, basically on site, back, right in the middle of all of that mess, and helped families find their loved ones and that was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had to see people who were completely shattered rally and support one another and you walk into this armory building they're all different the F FBI table was there and you know nurses stations and down in the basement was the list room where I was staying and people would families would come down looking for their loved ones on these lists to see if they were found or perished or what, and uh, the 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 love in that building was palpable, yeah. extremely profound, and that was a life changing experience for all of us. On uh, unfortunately, had to come through the World Trade Center, but yeah. you know, disaster does have a purpose. Again, you know, yeah. these despair moments. Um, that was a very profound experience. The strength of the human spirit really comes through at certain <laughs> critical yes. times, and it certainly did um, yes. um, at that time. But, um, yeah. Buffy, yeah. I feel I could talk to you for many hours, and we still would have <laughs> oh, so much to talk about. Yes, well, this uh, has been so wonderful. Hopefully sometime we can do this again, and we'll go into other areas that we haven't yes. had time to today. But thank you so much for being with us today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Well, thank you for making this happen, and um, I, I thoroughly appreciate all that you've done on this, and um, I hope that whoever gets to see this, um, they can learn something. You know, uh, my life has been a, a puzzle where all the pieces ended up where I am now, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I am now in a place where I feel very close to a deep sense of peace within myself and a deep sense of that special love within myself and um, connectedness to all beings and a love for humanity that is very profound, deeply touches my heart. So I look forward to the next time. Thank you again, Buffy. Thank you so much. And uh, goodbye for now. Okay, bye.